my work here at the Open University is focused on geomicrobiology, which is the study of how microbes interact with rocks. Now, on the face of it, you might think that's a rather esoteric, narrow area, isn't it? But actually, when you think about it, the interaction of life with rocks is all about living on a planet. If you live on a planet, you, limp on, you live on a lump of rock. So trying to understand how microbes get energy and nutrients from rocks is really quite fundamental to trying to understand how life survives on the Earth, how it might have survived in the past, and whether there could be life on other planets like Mars. And geomicrobiology addresses the interface between those areas. So in our lab here at the Open University, we study microbes in volcanic environments. We have a project in Iceland to study the colonization of lava flows there. We have projects to study microbes in impact shocked rocks. Um, we also have projects to launch rocks into space and study the survival of microbes under space conditions. So a full range of projects um, that look at the different aspects of microbes in rocky environments. And we try and link that into addressing questions about the survival of life on early Earth and also the possibilities for life on Mars. One of the questions that we want to address is, can microbes survive in space? And there's a number of reasons for looking at this. Uh, some of them are to try and see whether microbes could be transferred from one planet to another, this idea that planets are not isolated islands of life, but are actually connected with other planets, just like life can be transferred from one continent to another. Can life be transferred from one planet to another? We're not interested in answering the question, did life originate elsewhere? We're simply interested in answering the scientific question, are planets isolated islands of life? Also, we want to isolate microbes that could be of use for establishing a human presence on the Moon and Mars in, in the uh, immediate future. Can we isolate novel, extreme-tolerant microorganisms that we could use, for example, to break down rocks on the Moon and Mars and grow crops in them, uh, carry out... Uh, extraction of useful elements from rocks. You may not know that 25% of all the copper that's produced in the world, the copper you find in the wiring in your lights at home, is extracted from rocks using microorganisms. It's called biomining. And we could apply the same methods on other planets to extract useful elements to establish a permanent human presence in these environments. But we can only do that if we've got microbes that will survive in the space environment and are robust for human space exploration. So we've launched rocks into space and we've put them on the outside of the International Space Station. The rocks were launched into space on board a space shuttle. They were transferred to the space station in, in a spacewalk. And then they were left there for a year and a half. And then a year and a half later, they were transferred into another space shuttle, Space Shuttle Discovery and they were landed on Earth, and then we received the samples. And so we grow them up and see what survived. Now, the samples are from a fishing village in Devon called Beer, um, which is on the south coast of England. We chose that location because we had been studying the microorganisms that live in those rocks, and because they live on the edge of a cliff, it's a very extreme environment. Um, the beautiful fishing village of Beer in Devon may not seem to be an extreme environment, but for a microbe that lives in the cliffs down in beer. It's actually a very extreme environment. They're exposed to uh, salt water from the sea. They're exposed to periodic desiccation. They're exposed to extreme radiation conditions on the surface of the cliffs. So we had this idea that maybe in those cliffs there are unknown microbes that would survive the space conditions and that we could isolate by exposing the rocks to space. The microbes in space are desiccated. They're not active at all. And they're being exposed to extremes of vacuum, extremes of desiccation, very little water because of the vacuum, extremes of ultraviolet radiation. So the UV radiation that gives you a suntan on your summer holiday is uh, over a thousand times more damaging in space than it is in, um, in Benidorm. So these microbes are exposed to extreme conditions in space and these conditions will kill most things over a long period of time. But there are microbes that have very uh, effective repair mechanisms inside them that allow them to survive these extreme conditions. And when they come back to Earth, we can look and see which microbes have survived in the rocks. So we bring the rocks back and we put them in um, a liquid medium that provides them with their nutrients, and we see which microbes grow out of the rocks. And they're the microbes that have survived the year and a half in space, and the rest of them have been killed off. And after that experiment, only one species of 
uh, microorganisms survived. And so by looking at microbes in space, we can begin to address the question of whether planets are biogeographical islands, to use the, the technical terminology, or are they um, capable of exchanging life with other planets in a solar system? And the ultimate reason for, for answering this question is, if you had two planets in a solar system with conditions that were suitable for life, would life transfer between those two planets? Could you imagine a solar system with a real-life war of the worlds where you have two biospheres uh, evolving along a similar track? And if you think about it, we very, we very nearly came to that situation in our own solar system. If Mars had been, say, 20 or 30% more massive than it was, it probably would have had a magnetic field for longer. That would have prevented the atmosphere from being spotted away. It would have meant that there was liquid water on the surface of Mars for longer. And as a result, we may have had two planets in our solar system with uh, bodies of liquid water for a long period after the origin of those planets. And one could easily imagine the transfer of life between both of those planets continuously and a situation where you actually had two planets in our solar system with parallel biospheres and a situation where you really could have had you know, a, a real-life situation of two civilizations developing on two planets. And if we came so close to it in this solar system, is it so far to speculate that there might be stars out there with multiple planets with, with independent biospheres around the same star? We could do some damage to Mars if there's a biosphere there and something gets transferred and happens to be able to grow on the Martian surface. I think it's unlikely. The surface of Mars is a very forbidding place. There's very little liquid water. There may have been more in the past, but certainly at the present time, the surface is uh, oxidizing. There's very little liquid water. Anything landing on the surface is not going to last for very long, particularly something from Earth. Um, it may be a different story in the subsurface of Mars. Um, I think at the present time, it's unlikely things could grow and survive in the Martian surface or in the near-surface environment. When the axis of Mars changed in the past, what's called the obliquity, when that changed in the past, there may have been periods where there was more of a possibility of liquid water in the near-surface environment of Mars. So it may be that uh, during the last 100,000 years there have been habitats on Mars that were more favourable for life. I think in the present Martian epoch, if you were to crash a spacecraft on the surface of Mars, it's very unlikely you could do a lot of damage to a Martian biosphere. But having said that, it's prudent to take steps to prevent that from happening, even if it may be unlikely. We actually don't know enough about the possibility of life on Mars to be able to make a proper assessment. So without that knowledge, the best thing to do is to define regions on Mars called special regions, which are regions where you come closest to the possibility of habitable conditions and make those environments where you will not explore them, except if you sterilise the instrumentation that you send into those environments. And if you do that, then that is a conservative approach to preventing damage on Mars. If you later discover that there's no life on Mars or it's buried so deeply that nothing is going to uh, influence it, then you can relax those, um, those regulations and you can... Uh, carry out more um, uh, exploration with less stringent conditions. But that's something that has to come with a program of exploration that eventually uncovers what the real conditions are like. Europa is an interesting environment because there you have a, a planetary-wide ocean connected. It may be under a very thick ice layer, but we still don't really understand enough about the connection between the ocean and the surface environment of Europa to know whether if we landed bugs on the surface of Europa, they might be transferred into the European Ocean. So in the absence of that knowledge, the best thing to do is to make, take the most prudent approach, which is to try and prevent uh, space agencies from contaminating the surface of other planetary environments.